Welcome everyone. Hello. And um, I'm really grateful for so many of you taking the time out of your busy uh, schedules to, to take part in this webinar, um, uh, during which we're going to look at the issue of leadership in strengths-based uh, social care. In fact, we've got an enormous number of you um, taking the time to join this webinar. We're almost over uh, 270 uh, participants. And just to, to, just to give you an, a sense of who's out there, we've got people from Derby, Surrey, Birmingham, Devon, Peterborough, Hull, Wigan, Wales, and our friends uh, from Northern Ireland have joined as well, and Ireland, um, Republic of Ireland. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic to see uh, so many of you taking part in this uh, session. So just to, in terms of introductions, um, my name is uh, Ewan King. I'm the director, uh, one of the directors at the Social Care Institute for Excellence. We're a national charity a UK-wide charity committed to um, evidence-informed improvement in adults and children's social care. So, so that's me. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined by my colleagues, Charlotte. I'm going to get her surname wrong if I'm not careful, but August? August. <laughs> I knew I'd still get it wrong. Um, who is the chief executive of National Voices, that an umbrella char charity committed to placing uh, the person and their family at the heart of decisions about care and health. And Andrew Rees is joining us as well, um, head of service, I got that right? Uh, head of service from the London Borough of Camden. So um, we're going to hear more from my two colleagues uh, shortly. Um, just in terms of um, the rules for today, that, well, rules is a bit strong and not particularly strength based, so uh, let me start again. Um, what Some of the things that um, we're going to be discussing today include um, the opportunity to hear about some new research that uh, Sky has produced on leadership and strengths-based uh, social care. I'll talk you through, through that. Um, we'll then um, have some uh, opportunity for conversation and, and questions. Charlotte will then uh, talk about her perspective from being a uh, chief executive of an umbrella organization that represents a host of charities that are all engaged in different ways in strengths-based approaches. And then Andrew's going to talk about the journey in, uh, in Camden towards becoming uh, a strengths-based um, uh, borough. Just going to move the slides so you can see the running order. So this is broadly what I've just outlined. Um, there will be slides made available um, about in about two days' time, um, along with the, video, uh, the recording of the webinar and any questions and answers. So if you do have to leave early, um, don't don't worry. Um, we, you will be able to catch up with the webinar later. And if you've got any colleagues that unfortunately had to miss out today, do make them aware that there will be a video and uh, a, sorry, a, a recording and slides av uh, available in the near future. So here's the plan. I I'm going to talk briefly about the research that we published last week. This is research on leadership in strengths-based um, environments, looking at what the role of leadership looks like, what does the leadership task entail, um, and also addressing the question of whether leadership is fundamentally different uh, in a strengths-based social care context. Does it need to be different? So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, and then, as I've said, we'll have opportunities to, to look at some of the questions coming in, and Charlotte will speak. Uh, um, more time for questions after that, and then Andrew will speak. But we will leave as much time as possible at the end to make sure that we cover all the questions uh, um, and discussion points coming in on the screen in front of us. So I hope that makes sense as a plan. We're, we do have one final rule, and this is a, a charity contribution rule. Um, any me mention of Brexit, and I have to put one pound in a jar to go to charity. It's five pounds if anyone mentions the DUP. It's ten pounds if you mention Dominic Grieve, and it's 20 pounds if you mention the rather obscure and Patterson. But anyway, Bit of a charity uh, uh, element there. If you, you can't just write it on the screen. You actually have to put the money into a charity if you, you decide to go down this route. Um, OK, so I'm going to kick off now with, um, so I seem to be stuck, Steve, uh, on the slides. Thank you. Um, st still stuck there. Could you give me on to the next slide, please, Steve? Thank you. OK, um, so as I've said, about two weeks ago, we published this paper on leadership in strengths-based social care. Um, it builds on a number of papers um, and uh, think pieces that we've been producing for really about four years um, now, ever since the, the, the CARE Act. 
and it seeks to explore, as I've said, some of the issues about how you do really effective leadership in the social care, strength-based social care uh, context. But just before I go into that in any more detail, I do think it's important just to give you uh, a definition, because I think um, not everyone necessarily knows uh, a lot about strengths-based approaches. But we recently produced a guide for the National Institute for Clinical Excellence on strengths-based approaches. And we just defined it very simply as a way of delivering care and support which focuses on people's strengths, skills, and resources in communities, as well as their needs and difficulties. So you're not ignoring the fact that some people do need support, but you are trying to start with their strengths, their capabilities, and their social networks. And on that, and from that, build uh, um, support and care that gives that person a better, a better life. So that's the definition uh, that we're working on. If you go onto our website, under strengths-based approaches, you'll find videos and resources that can, get, can give you more detail about strengths-based approaches. Next slide, please. So um, one of the first issues that the paper um, tries to explore is uh, a definition of, of, of leadership and strengths-based approaches. Um, one of the things that's really struck us over the last four years is that we're not really talking about a traditional model of leadership that's often applied in, in, in public services. So it's less about the development of one or two heroic leaders, charismatic leaders who uh, single-mindedly drive change from the top down and make things happen. And everyone looks to those leaders for change, for their, for their direction and for their inspiration. That kind of approach to leadership really doesn't work within a strengths-based environment. Um, it is much more about convening people, bringing them together to develop a shared vision, a shared plan for changing services. It is much more about working with people who provide care and support and service users and citizens in designing care that works for them. So it's about co-production. And it's also about working beyond the narrow confines of your own individual organization or services. It's about what some would describe as being a systems leader, looking to other partners, looking to the voluntary and community sector, looking to citizens to help you um, move forward. And this is a quote from Alex Fox, who's the chief executive for Shared Lives Plus. He's also on Sky's board. And I think it's a really good one. I think it brings this definition to life. A strengths-based approach requires a, a new kind of leadership, which draws strength from many more sources, the whole team, the voluntary sector and other partners, and most importantly, from citizens themselves, Leaders practicing strengths-based approaches will not try to affect change by themselves. They will share rather than hoard power, which in turn will enable them to ask more of those around them. The key measure of success is not your own strength, but the combined strength and capacity of the whole system. So I think that's a really useful definition to have in your head when you're thinking about how to do leadership in this context. So moving on, the paper then goes on to discuss a number of themes that emerge through the research. So when we spoke to directors of adult social care, principal social workers, um, to inform this research, we were told um, one of the most important issues was to encourage, for leaders to encourage a positive attitude to risk. Very much harder to do in practice than uh, in reality than it is to write this down on paper, but it is something that's absolutely criti critical to the success of strengths-based approaches. And this entails having a different um, story or narrative to tell on risk. It's about saying that risk can often bring about, taking risk can often bring about benefits and improvements as well as harm. Risk doesn't always lead to harm. If you encourage your practitioners and your colleagues to take managed risks, appropriately managed risks, then they can really bring about uh, improvement. And Andrew's you know, already uh, agreeing from his perspective in, in Camden, and that's absolutely crucial. And that entails leaders giving people the permission to take risks and backing them up when something goes wrong. So avoiding that blame culture, which so often permeates social care. And it's about providing constructive, not harmful challenge, not critical uh, and negative challenge, but constructive challenge uh, to colleagues so that they do feel that they have the space to be brave and to take positive action. Another theme that emerged from the research is about the importance of encouraging professional autonomy. 
which again links to this idea of encouraging people to take positive risks. This is about take, uh, empowering staff to take ownership of the solutions and interventions. By that I mean getting staff at all levels involved in actually designing services, designing commissioning uh, frameworks, evaluating services so that they feel that they own it. It's about providing staff with a broad framework of principles but then trusting them to get on with it. And I was actually looking at a quote last night from someone called Donna Hall, who is recently the Chief Executive of Wigan Council. And they're doing, I think, very well on strengths-based approaches. And she said it's about being tight on principles, loose on delivery. And I think it's really quite a, quite a powerful quote. It's about giving staff control over resources as much as possible, and I'll come on to that shortly. And it's about devolving responsibility to the lowest level that seems proportionate. So increasingly, in, in, in areas that are doing well on this, you'll see very localized teams working closely with the local community and they seem to have a degree of autonomy and power to make decisions on the part on the on behalf of residents and, and, and others. So this is an example from, from a colleague in, in Wolverhampton. They focus very specifically on devolving responsibility and control to staff. So they've really tried to work to move away from funding panels where all the decisions about funding and for care packages have to be made by managers. They try to devolve this decision making down into the team, down into huddles of, te uh, of colleagues who get together and think very creatively about how they can support an individual. And similarly, they give people a budget which they can spend for an individual at their discretion, which is a very powerful thing to be able to, to ask a, a colleague to do. It's all about investing in leadership across the organization. As I've said, and as Alex Fox said in his quote, it's not about holding power and control amongst a, a few individuals. It's about enabling leadership to take root in many parts of the organization. So it's about engaging staff in early conversations about what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it. And I think we're going to hear more from Andrew about how they're doing that in Camden. It's about sharing and devolving decision making to all levels within the organization. Um, and I think I've said this already, it's about supporting them to actually take ownership of new ways of delivering services. Thank you. Um, much of this is about going back to, to what was good social work, and uh, good social work many years ago. This is not necessarily anything uh, brand new. So very good social work involves very good reflective supervision, which um, people can, can benefit from. So in areas that are doing really well on, on strengths-based approaches, we heard a lot about the importance of very well-organized uh, uh, reflective supervision that enables people to focus on their skills um, and also hear about what's working well and learn from what's working well. It's about having reflexive conversations, it's about employing tools like motivational interviewing, strengths-based or open-ended inquiry to encourage people to open up and reflect on how they're supporting people. And it's about protecting time. Never easy to do in practice, but it is something that is critical if you're going to get this right. Thank you. All right. Thank you for waiting. Um, so co-production, absolutely uh, um, a strength of those doing this really well uh, across the country. So in places like Hertfordshire, they've set up a strategic co-production board. Um, comprising people with lived experience who really do get stuck into uh, strategic decisions about how adult social care is organized and delivered. In Camden, they have a citizens assembly which they uh, go to in order to, to, to test out ideas and develop new ways of delivering uh, services. There are many examples across the country which people can learn from. So it's about engaging with communities in early conversations, avoiding the surprises that inevitably happen when you make decisions without people uh, being involved. It's about looking for those opportunities to involve people and that really should be all the way through the process of designing, commissioning, delivering and evaluating services. And as I've said, looking for those platforms but being creative using digital technology, using um, existing forums which people can piggyback onto to try and bring people together to look at and, and get involved in, in decisions. I'm just going to end with um, a really nice uh, visual, which is from Camden. Actually, it's going to uh, reappear a bit later when Andrew speaks. But this is uh, a, a really uh, attractive, beautiful picture, which was created by um, an artist who basically captured a conversation during a day in Camden about what people wanted from a strengths-based approach. 
And it wasn't just done for its own sake. The actual uh, diagram was used to inform uh, tools that are now used to, to evaluate the impact of strengths-based approaches in Canada. So it's a really, it was a really a powerful exercise that informed how they deliver uh, services across Canada. So um, that's it from, from me for now. But what I'm going to do um, is just see, um, first, if my colleagues want to contribute on the back of my presentation, but also see if there's any questions that have come up so far that we might be able to answer. We seem to have a few questions about payment cards. I don't know whether you want to say something about that, frontline staff being able to actually spend some money. So yes, I mean this is, so the example I gave is, is one example, but I know it's not universal that staff have access to payment cards. I do know that our colleagues, Think Local Act Personal, have produced a paper recently on, on payment cards and, and adult social care, so it may well be worth looking at how how they uh, what they've come up with through their research. Um, so, ha so have a look at that, and I think my colleague Steve will try to find the um, the, the reference for that. Andrew, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, just seeing a question come up at uh, the graphic facilitator from Camden. If you look carefully when the slides come out, her name is at the bottom. Clearly, we wouldn't want to put a put a picture out there without uh, without um, uh, giving her appropriate. Um, uh, praise. Um, I can't read it from my slide, but I'm sure we can we can find it and stick it in there so that people. But the, there are a, a large number of graphic facilitators out there who do an excellent job. So it's right, Sandra Howgate. Sandra oh, okay. Howgate. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, any other questions um, that we should take at this moment, or if not, um, I'm going to suggest that we move on. So, Charlotte. It would be great if you could now take us through your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Charlotte. I am um, a recent CEO um, at National Voices. National Voices is a, an umbrella organisation coalition of about 160 charities uh, across health and care. Personally, I know a lot more about the NHS than I do about social care. So I've got a slight um, bout of imposter syndrome, seeing who's on this chat and who's on this webinar since you all know so much more about um, how social work is commissioned and designed and delivered. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to our discussion later and, and, and learning from you as well. Um, the other thing I should probably say is that um, I'm less um, um, involved in frontline delivery or a point of care delivery. I'm really sort of, you know, I come from a bit of a policy wonky place. And part of the reason why people give membership fees to National Voices is that they want us to sit at the sort of top table of influencing, which is something we do, but it means I come at it maybe more from a sort of um, policy and service design level rather than um, service delivery. But I think we hear later from the actual point of care. So I think in combination, it should be a really interesting range of perspectives. So if you could move me on to my next slide, thank you. So, I am basically going to try to convince you that in order to asset-based and strength-based work, you need to really understand what goes on in people's lives. And that's easier said than done. Um, I, don't, I think if you don't understand what goes on in people's lives, you can't answer three really important questions. Who cares? Who's on the team? And who adds value around here? And what adds value around here? And I always show a picture, and I hope you can see that it doesn't come out too small on your screens. There's a baby lying in a cot looking up at a toy. And clearly the toy's been designed um, for people looking down on it, because the interesting bits of this baby toy, the heads that let you decide whether you're looking at an elephant or a pig or a tiger, are right at the top, whereas the baby only sees bums, which are pretty ill-defined. So the... For me, this sort of captures really quite nicely that we do not know what goes on in a service and how it feels to engage with it if we do not get into the user's shoes. Um, and that is the challenge I'm going to try to talk to you about. Um, my next slide um, starts off with a statistic that anyone in health policy will know um, already. I don't know whether you've all seen it before. Assuming we've got about 5,000 waking hours in a year and the average diabetes patients might spend around five of those with um, a healthcare professional, that amounts to 0.1% of time we spend in the presence of a healthcare professional if we have one long-term condition like diabetes. 
So that raises some really acute questions about where is health actually being created around here? Who manages diabetes? And where should we focus our, our efforts to improve health and care? And what makes for good outcomes? So my kind of hypothesis would be, if you're a diabetes nurse and you're delivering a diabetes service out of primary care, um, you haven't got a chance in hell of improving someone's services if you do someone's outcomes, if you do not understand what goes on in those 4,995 hours where the diabetes patient does this on their own. And the chances of actually getting to the bottom of that and really improving someone's outcomes are going to be massively reduced if the patient and the person living with diabetes isn't able to say, this is what goes on for me. This is how I feel about food. This is the food I cook for my children. This is the money I have every week. This is the place where I live. I haven't even got a cooker. I haven't even got a fridge. So if all of those things don't surface in a professional consultation, I think our chances of achieving good health outcomes are very much reduced. Um, the next slide I'm going to show is the talk about is again one that if you have been hanging around health policy circles, you will have come across before. Um, this one actually straddles health and social care, and it's um, a web of care that was documented by Barbara, who looked after Malcolm for about 17 years, and Malcolm had diabetes, not diabetes, dementia. Um, and this web documents the last seven years of Malcolm's and Barbara's engagement with services. Um, so we could obviously talk about care integration and care coordination, all of that, and I, I'm 100% sure you have those conversations. I want to sort of zoom out a little bit and say, who knows who's on the team? And I think the only person who knows who's on the team here are Malcolm and Barbara. So nominally in charge of this web of care probably is the consultant. So Malcolm will probably be towards the end of his life under the care of a dementia or Alzheimer's consultant. But I would, you know, has guess that this consultant would not know how to reach the alternating mattress technician. Maybe not even how to reach the physiotherapist. And they might not even know who employs the mattress technician. So if we do not listen to the person at the center of this web, we haven't really got a clue who is around that person and who makes this web. Now, um, Barbara said, and I think that is true and will forever be true, Care is care, a care is care. You're the only ones who divide it into primary, secondary, and social care, and so on. I would add one more thing, that this web is not even complete in my view, because what's missing here is clearly that, and I'm now improvising, I don't know whether this was going on for Malcolm and Barbara, um, there might be a neighbor who drops off a meal once a week, because they've agreed that, and they want to help Barbara, because they think she's got a lot on. And there might be, a daughter who lives a long way away, but she makes a point of coming once a week, one weekend a month to give Barbara time off or to take Malcolm out. And there might be someone from the church where Malcolm and Barbara have been for years and years who takes them on a Sunday and, and um, includes them in their activities. So again, if we want to really think through how we can improve people's outcomes and how we can provide much more effective support. We need to bother listening to people like Malcolm and Barbara and let them map out for us who they're drawing their strength from and what is already helping in their lives. And I could show you diagrams like that for every single condition. And a lot of people have more than one thing wrong with them. It is entirely possible, if not likely, that Malcolm had more than Alzheimer's towards the end of his life. And it was this insight that led us to another piece of work um, I did in a, in a previous role, I was previously involved with the Richmond Group of Charities, which is a smaller coalition of larger charities, if that makes sense. And we set up this cross-sectoral task force, which was wanting to look at people living with multiple long-term conditions. And we interviewed um, a whole lot of people, and where this grey, blurry um, uh, icon is, there is a little video that if you get these slides uh, at a later stage, you can, you can watch. And we produced four short, short videos. And there are four crucial questions we've identified from listening to people living with multiple long-term conditions, what goes on for them. And they 
we were sort of trying to understand how we could talk about their lives respectfully and in a, in a way that would make a difference. And we arrived at a framing that says this is about a series of losses and adaptations. We didn't just want to tell a story of miserable lives because those people had adapted really well to what was going on for them. And there were four areas where we thought this is what health service providers need to know about. Mental well-being, mobility, social connectedness and the ability to self-care. And the people in our sample, here you can see Vivian, or you can't because you've only got an icon, um, they had found really interesting ways of um, coping with their loss of mobility or limits to their mobility or their, the impacts their various conditions had on their mental well-being and their social connectedness. So in summary, what I'm really trying to push home is that we cannot afford not to understand what goes on for other people, for the people who use our services. Um, in other sectors, if we didn't understand how our users live, we would go bankrupt. And here, we just become unsustainable. I think those are two really nice quotes, one very modern one and very, one very old one, um, that sets out why we, re we really need to work harder in understanding um, how people's lives um, are lived. So I'm going to have two very brief additional points to make. One is what does this mean for charities? Um, and um, I would really like to hear your thoughts on this because I, I see on the, on the chat that some of you do work for VCSE organisations and, and some, of them, some of you don't, but it'd be interesting to understand that. I think we sometimes say in a slightly glib way that we're better at this than statutory services. And I want us to sort of challenge ourselves a little bit around this. Um, can we... Um, what makes us think that our services are better at understanding where people are at and building on their assets? And what does it mean for VCSE staff to be involved in service provision? Do we just plug the gaps that are left behind when statutory services pull out? Or is, do we have a more transformative ambition that enables people to regain their independence, to build stronger connections and to live more active lives? And is the role of a, of a charity staff member maybe, you know, could we maybe um, sort of summarise it as being someone who helps people strengthen their connections? Um, I'm thinking of a charity who is a member of National Voices Groundswell. I don't know whether you've heard of them, but they're a, they help homeless people access health services, which is really hard for them to do. To do. And obviously they could send someone like me out on the streets and talk to people who are in street homelessness. Um, to help them access their GP services, but they don't. They actually send people out who have themselves been affected by homelessness, and they have a really interesting peer support model where people who are themselves affected by homelessness take other homeless people to register with GPs and help them go to appointments and help them make sense of what health professionals are saying. And they've also branched out into really interesting peer research methodologies where people who are living with homelessness or in, are vulnerably housed actually put on the record what are issues that health services need to address. And if they found a really sustainable model of working whereby half their staff have come out of homelessness and have, they have created roles that are accessible to people who are otherwise a long way away from the labour market. So I think it's those sorts of models we need to think much more about. And then finally, I have been doing a restructure and a re-strategy and a repurposing of National Voices in the way that you do when you start as a CEO somewhere. Um, and the question of what does this mean for an umbrella organisation has really become quite acute because I think we are a very small organisation. When I wrote these slides, we were six people. We're now eight, I'm, say, I'm pleased to say. But it's still a tiny organisation and we could keep saying, oh, we're too small, we can't do this. We're too small, we can't come to your event, we can't feel someone for your working group, we can't find a person with this thing going on in their lives. Or we could start thinking, what are our assets? We've got 160 members, we've got 100 directors of policy, we've got 100 CEOs, we've got 100 director of services. Surely they can feel someone, surely they can find someone who can help them, surely we could between us commission some research. So I've been trying to sort of um, grapple in my own organisation with what this means to work in an asset-based way. Are we small or are we large? And I think um, we're probably both. So that's it from me. I'm really interested to hear what your questions are. Here are a few questions that came to my mind as I was thinking through the topic of today's 
conversation. Um, one that's really hot in my mind is um, I'm sometimes a little bit suspicious when I hear um, politicians, particularly on the right of the political spectrum, saying, "Oh, yeah, we can, you know, we can cut this service because we have to all just be a bit better neighbours and we have to just all look after each other a bit better." And I think we need to be very careful in talking about asset-based services and asset-based ways of working that we don't inadvertently fall into a trap of saying people don't need personal care, they need just better neighbours. So that's one of the questions that's quite live in my mind, being more on the sort of political side of my work. But you might obviously have very different questions or very different thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. That was really good, really helpful. Um, I'm just picking up a few questions here, um, which I'll try to address before I hand over to, to Andrew. Um, so there was a question about um, whether Sky had resources um, to support um, practitioners work with people with different um, cultural backgrounds, different um, levels of mental capacity, and um, and various other um, circumstances that make the make it sometimes difficult to work with with people. We do on our website. There are a range of videos um, and tools and resources that I think can help. Um, Practitioners work with with communities of all types and people with all kinds of backgrounds. So do do have a look at our website. Um, there's, there's plenty on it. Um, and someone said they also would like a um, an interactive guide about what works in in strengths based approaches. I guess Sky, along with organisations like Research and uh, Ripfa, um, Think Local, Act Personal, uh, Skills for Care, LGA, are gathering. Uh, examples of good practice all the time. Um, we try to bring many of those examples together on our website. But if you do have a good example, a case study, a bit of evaluated work that you're proud of, do send it in to us and we'll try to get it onto our website. We're happy to post blogs as well with people uh, telling us about what they've achieved locally. So please, please do that. Um, and I think. I think that's the main question. We did hear some examples, see some examples of people working very productively, very successfully in the local voluntary sector, including Marie Curie was, was mentioned and Macmillan. So that so that's really good to hear. Um, any questions, thoughts, comments that you would like to pick up on Charlotte Andrew before I hand on to you? Uh, there's one question I'll pick up within my uh, someone asked about servant leadership, so maybe I'll try and cover that and when I get to the, the right slide if I remember, if I don't, prod me. Okay. Um, and apologies for ending up using jargon. I hadn't realised that RECSE is actually really quite jargony. It stands for Voluntary Community and Social Enterprise Sector, I think. Um, yes, so we all speak to our own little bubbles and we get used to using our own little terminology. So thanks for picking up on that and thanks for whoever it was who explained it. Uh, I should have explained that myself. No. Right, so Andrew, would you like to talk about your experiences in, in Camden? Okay, absolutely. So um, we, we uh, I regularly go to uh, something called Planning Together, which is our partnership board in Camden, and we have a jargon buster who rings a bell if we speak, if we use long words or words that people don't understand. I don't think we, uh, I'm hopefully, I'm because I'm so used to trying to do, uh, comply with that and not get the bell rung or get a red card, even if it's terrible, that uh, this will be pretty straightforward. So, um, yeah, my name's Andrew Rees. I'm, I'm head of Camden's Learning Disability Service. I'm part of um, Camden's uh, Adult Social Care Senior Management Team. Um, my email address is on the slide if there are any questions that, that come up that you want to follow up. Um, so what I'm going to give you is a bit of an overview of uh, what I, I like to think of as our first leg in our journey to becoming or to starting to deliver strength-based practice and become a strength-based or an organisation that's focused on people's strengths. Um, I'm not going to read out the slides because they're there, you can read them yourselves. Um, I'll be offering some commentary as we go on. I think it's probably the most accurate way to describe what I'm going to do. So this slide is a, about the vision in Camden and I think it's vital that a strength-based approach has to be based on a very clear vision. It has, it has to be a whole organisation approach. It's not just a case of putting in some new assessment paperwork and thinking that's going to make the difference. Um, it's something you have to pretty much review everything you're doing, I think, in terms of how you're going to do that. And some of the most interesting work we're doing in Camden is, is I think, is about re-evaluating re our relationship with providers. I think we're working really hard to change that, and that's a really important thing for us. 
Um, it has to be based on the values of the organization, I think. So it's owned by the whole council. And the values here, I think you heard you and talk about citizens' assembly. These were co-produced through our citizens' assembly. It was led by our um, leader of the council, Georgia Gould, who's very um, much behind the concept of citizens' assemblies. Um, if you read the Guardian, you'll know that we uh, Camden had a citizens' assembly on climate change. Um, we didn't do one on Brexit, but I know what people of Camden think. One pound in the jar. Pound. There we go. I know what people of Camden think about Brexit on the whole. Well, three pounds in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it was also informed by an exercise across the council, which was called an outcomes-based budget review. So we looked at our budget strategically and tried to work out exactly what outcomes those budgets were delivering. So the fact that I'm spending money in social care, um, well, that also um, has an economic benefit because in theory it creates jobs. So how do we think about um, that as a whole council and in particular how do we then make sure that when we're spending social care money it's benefiting people of Camden, people of Camden are getting the jobs. Um, and out of that sort of um, co-production type um, approach, we developed two strategies. So there was the first one was the supporting people connecting communities. So that was developed by uh, um, through adult social care, again through the citizens assembly. You've seen some of the output from that citizens assembly in those um, um, the the the, um, the slide that uh, Ewan showed earlier. And also Camden 2025, which is our corporate strategy, and again that was developed um, in a co-productive thing. And I, 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 I think it's great to work for an organisation. One of the values is everyone has a chance to succeed, nobody gets left behind. I think we can hang pretty much everything we do on that, particularly in the learning disability field, is making sure people don't, go, don't get left behind. And it's a really good way of motivating staff and reminding people why we're there. Um, if we move on... So this is another one of the slides that we produced at the, the What Matters event. So again, that was a co-production thinking about what does, and you can't really see it very well here, but it's, um, I've, I've got a little outtake of it later to, to focus on. Um, so that was a, what the, were they, the focus groups held with people who use um, social care services, and these were the things that were important to them. Um, within learning disability, we had a slightly a smaller um, initiative around and um, working out what um, what was important to people and we went out and talked to um, through planning together which is our partnership board we talked to groups of people with learning disability we talked to their families and we talked to our providers and just asked the basic question what does good look like and then we took what we got back from that and turned that into the CLDS promise so this is the thing to say, this is what we're going to try to do. It's an easy read. Um, the, the, if you click on the where it says CLDS Promise when you get the slides, there's a link to the document there. Um, so you can actually start to see the sort of things people told us. We go to the next slide. And I think at both these events, both the What Matters event, which is a wider social care, and also think at the when we're creating the CLDS Promise, one of the things that really came out, and this resonates with a lot of what the chief social worker is talking about at the moment, is the importance of relationship-based practice. People very clearly told us they want to work with the same person. They don't want to um, get confused and have a different social worker every time. Um, they want, and whether that's through the social worker or whether that's through their pro the staff who provide their support, they want to have that continuity. And the the picture on the right is is a little outtake from those um, the slides you just pictures we just saw earlier, the graphic facilitation. Um, someone you trust who comes on the journey with you. I think that's that's really important, and it's it's a really strong message that underpins um, all the, the the sort of feedback and the messages we've we've had from um, from our citizens assemblies and our co-production events if I then talk more practically about Camden's journey towards um, strength-based approaches um, we I think you need a model to st uh, to start you off on the journey you need some sort of theoretical framework in which to to, to start to build your um, your practice um, there are lots of different models out there. We opted for the Partners of Change Develop model called the um, uh, Three Conversations. Again, there's a link to the Partnership, Partners for Change website at the bottom of the slides. Um, and it, it provided us, it was a starting point, I think, and it provided a framework and something we could then use to co-produce a new way of working. I'm not going to go into the theory of the Three Conversations um, model. Um, you can look at that up for yourself later if you're not doing it. 
by the sound of it, there's a lot of you doing it anyway because you're the the, the 200 pound budgets, the, the payment cards. One that's one of the really important um, messages coming out of the Partners for Change is, is devolve that particularly that quick and easy way to spend money down to the practitioners. And I think the other thing that we have used in terms of a model is we use the model as something that staff can then develop and build on. So it's not it doesn't arrive as a, it's not a Lego kit and you don't build it into something and it you know exactly what it's going to look like at the end. You start as journey, you don't quite know where you're going to end up at the end because your staff will take you in a different direction. And the consultation you have with people using services might also change that as well. Um, Sorry, next slide. Uh, one of the things I thought was really helpful about three conversations is these rules. Um, and I think with these are sort of a, these rules are like a, again a, they're scaffolding. They're something that helps you build, and they're a challenge to make you think differently. Um, they had a very very strong emphasis on changing the language. Don't talk. They had a whole list of banned words: uh, front door, um, pathway, all sorts of things. Where you're starting to talk about process, and their language is much more focused on people. Um, don't talk about assessment because what in is assessment? Talk about conversations. It's about getting it more, making the your contact with people more personal and more real and everyday rather than more formal and more professional. Um, and I think you know, part of what you need to, we need to be able to do it, and, uh, is abandon the language of care management. We, so most of us, I qualified in 96, so the NHS Community Care Act was out by that point. We're so um, embedded almost within the culture of care management assessments and reviews is really difficult to let go of it but I think we need to we need to be able to move on and start thinking differently about it and stop measuring processes in the way that we've been measuring processes for so long next slide please so um, and then as I said we had a, a really strong message from from people we engage with about the importance of relationship-based practice. So I just meant, want to mention a couple of things that I think are most interesting that we're doing in Camden. A plug for my service, uh, the Camden Learning Disability Service, in our work on the, the named social worker model. Um, we were sort of privileged to be part of the um, named social worker pilot, and this is very much developed out of the, the named social worker model. And the challenge that that gave to our social work team in particular about how we rethink our uh, relationship um, with people. I think also the name worker model also developed out of some, some quite difficult work we did around um, um, a social safeguarding adults review for someone we support who was placed in a care home in Sussex who, and there was a very serious incident with him while in that care home his leg was broken someone else's leg was broken in the same way on the same day and we started to think about the risk for people who are placed out of area a long way away and so we start use um, the particularly use that named worker model in working with people in out of area placements because they're the highest risk um, but also we want to make sure that people aren't just stagnating and if they're placed out of area that there's some sort of progression that we we expect people to to change and develop and not just to, they're out of sight out of mind um, the named worker model we're also using in supported living and a big part of that is around um, we've got I think um, 30 um, supported living schemes within, within the borough and each scheme has a, has a named social worker so everybody living in the scheme has the same worker working with them and that's part of our drive to improve partnership working with providers. We, when we started doing this our providers described um, CLDS as patronising, officious and condescending and we thought well, we need to do something about that. So, so this is very much part of how crazy it is. So that's very much part of how, how to improve those relationships and um, become more effective by doing that. And, and we've had some really positive feedback from providers, from, from people living in supported living, from families as well about what a difference it's made, knowing you just you know who you need to talk to. You don't have to sort of get stuck in the phone system trying to work out who's who's going to come back to you or sending an email and just when you get the out of office thinking who am I going to contact next. Um, the other model that I think is that Camden is, is really sort of leading the way on is um, adult family group conferences. So this is a model that developed in, um, in children's social care. I think it came out in New Zealand originally. 
and was was sort of well developed within um, children's social care in Camden. And this, sort of, you know, if someone had a bright idea, let's start using that in adult social care, and it's starting to make a real difference. Where you've got stuck systems, where you've got a family that's in dispute with the council or in dispute with itself, often um, a family group conference can be really positive. And you know, it's really good about the, helping the network of people um, around an adult with care needs understand what their strengths are, who can do what, and sort of getting people together and um, not being exploited and used instead of paid for services, but actually being a much more sort of um, relationship based um, and sort of real life uh, support network for people. Um, I think some of the other thing in terms of strength-based working is the, the emphasis on, on knowing your localities and knowing what's out there. So we're moving towards um, within um, social care, adults, the, the broader adult social care, so the reason, which are mainly um, might be traditionally understood as, as older people's teams. We're moving towards some neighbourhood working teams and so there will be integrated with, with um, district nurses, etc. But one of the things those local teams are doing, and they've been doing some of what they call the walk the mile, so they've basically been doing uh, lunch and learn sessions where people from the locality get together and just go and walk around the local neighbourhood. And there's some, I'm not, uh, hopefully you can read them, there's some really nice quotes from the people who've done that about the sort of things they find that when they're going out on those walks, the people they're bumping into, the resources they're finding out about, which is all part of helping people connect into their local communities more effectively. And then just finishing, if we move to the next slide, it's just some think, thinking about what happens next. Um, I, you know, moving toward becoming a strength-based organisation is is a long journey, and we're in the early stages of it in Camden. I think is the fair way of saying it. And what else are we doing in order to to take the next steps of that program? Um, so we've got a What Matters coaching program for staff, and that's going down. We have very strong um, um, feedback from staff about effect, how effective that is. And that's uh, making staff think differently about the type of conversations they're having and thinking about having coaching-type conversations with people. Um, and that's um, been, we think is going to be really effective. Um, there's some further development of things like the recovery model in mental health social work and, and getting a clearer idea within learning disability social work and learning disability services more generally about the progression model and what sort of things we do um, in order to, to, to remember that everybody, um, even the people with the most profound level of needs, can progress, even if they're very only very tiny um, um, steps that people can still make small steps and it's about if you understand that person well you can start to think about exactly what sort of what a progression might mean, mean for um, um, for that particular person. Um, we need to get better at employment, our employment rates are not good um, and that we've got a project launching which is looking at a whole council approach to um, getting people into employment who've been tradition have traditionally not found it easy to get employment. So that some of that's around neighbourhood working because we've got pockets of, of high levels of unemployment in, in a relatively affluent borough. But that's also looking particularly looking at disabled people and the council thinking about what it can do to be a better employer. Um, we've just launched um, some supported internships within the council and we've got our supported intern working in the team with us helping as part of our meet and greets. Um, and welcoming people into the council uh, team. Um, you'd be a bit shocked to hear this, but Camden hasn't currently got a shared life, so we're developing our shared lives offer. We think that's a really important part of, of supporting people to be staying within their local communities. And the, we're starting to think about what a performance framework would look like. It is, so ASCOF is probably 12, 11 years old now or something, I can't remember exactly, but it's, it, there are bits of it that are good, but there are other bits of it that we still need to think about more and then trying to develop a lot more. Okay, so that was the end of my presentation. So there's a question here. How difficult was it to move from the organisational approach to co-production? Um, I think it's about just deciding you're going to do it. I think, you know, and having a chief exec and a leader of the council and uh, DAS, Deputy Chief Exec, who are all committed to that, is really important. I think it, this is a whole organisation thing. You can do little bits of co-production on your own. There's nothing to stop individual services and individual teams try to do that. But if it's part of that wider whole, it's much more effective. And people understand 
where it's coming from as well, I think, which is all really important. Just just one more for you. Uh, thanks for that, Andrew. Right, just one more um, about family group conferencing. Just to say that our last webinar, which we did with Camden, focused on family group conferencing for children and young people, uh, and, and is really well worth having having a look at that. Um, but there's a question about can you have a young carer in a family group conference to get their perspective on, on what's needed? A young carer. Uh, absolutely. If there is a young carer, they would be absolutely essential to a family group conference. It, the, the family group conference brings together everybody. Um, and sometimes the, the, it won't just be uh, people in the family. It could be neighbours, other um, uh, relevant people. It's up to the person who the subject of the family group conference to decide who's going to be there. And the I think one of the things that makes it work well for Camden is we have independent facilitators for it. So the social worker steps back mm -hmm. and allows people to have a conversation when, they, when they're not there to some extent and mm -hmm. then reflect that back to the social worker. So there's, there's a, it gives a really high level of independence. And so sort of done. Mm -hmm. The skilled facilitators are very good at drawing out what's important to people. Um, another question about performance framework. Well, when I know, I can uh, <laughs> can post on that. But I think it's, it's much more thinking about moving away from process-based measures. Um, I think one of the things that um, I'm particularly proud of in Camden is we had nobody with a learning disability admitted to a mental health hospital last year. I think those are the sort of things we need to be thinking about more. Um, what? How do we measure prevention? How? Yeah, that not being admitted to hospital, I think, is really important. Getting people out effectively and quickly, yes, you need to be able to do that, but actually stopping them going in in the first place is really important. Um, so we had a, an initiative last year, we were repeating this year, about making, trying to get as many of our staff to get flu jabs. Our nursing team went off and got themselves trained as, as peer injectors so they could give people um, flu jab because Public Health England are telling us that one thing you can do, the, mo the most important thing you can do as a social care organisation is make sure everyone's had a flu jab, stops people going into hospital in the first place. So Thank you that much. focus on prevention is really important for Thank us. Thank you. I'm just going to hand over to Charlotte. I think there's a couple of questions. Yeah, there was a question to... from someone called Andrea, I think, about co-production as the way forward, which obviously, you know, is a truism. And I always think it's quite helpful to think about co-production on, on three levels. So. On one level, we are all citizens and we pay for health and social care. And the way that, um, you know, we've just heard Camden engage with citizens about what they want from the health and social care. And I think it's really important to understand at that level that a lot of people don't use health and social care very much. I think something like 80% of people are very casual or occasional users of health services and it's probably going to be even more so social care. And therefore they don't understand health and social care very much. And um, one thing around social care, for example, might be that they don't understand that there is a lot of working age adults who use social care. So you have to be careful what questions you ask of a citizen when you do co-production. Um, and in healthcare, what people who are just citizens and aren't actually very heavy users of social care mostly care about is access points. So they care about the GP access and the A&E access. And they have much less of a view about what goes on behind that door and how do we need to coordinate services a lot better. So that's the citizen engagement. And then the second level is People who actually use services, the community of people who use services understand what services need to look like and what they need to deliver for them and their lives. And when you redesign your paediatric services or your kidney care services or your home visiting, you need to engage with the people who use the services. And then on the third level, it's the personal level. When you sit with a health professional or with a care professional and you talk about what needs to happen in your life for the next year or so, or in this emergency or crisis situation, the outcome needs to be co-produced. So I think it's really helpful to understand that this needs to happen at different levels and that different questions are appropriate for different people. Sometimes I feel the NHS wants to engage with citizens about questions that really only matter to people who are very heavy mental health service users and vice versa. So you need to kind of get your questions right and then find the right channels to communicate with people. Brilliant. I just um, spotted quite a few questions being raised about... Can I chip in on one there? Yeah, yeah, there go was, for it. There yeah, yeah. a question, I think it was Daniel, what did... What did we do to get our leader of the council to engage? We didn't. It was, it was very much driven from from the top. She was very keen on this. This is something that's very important to Georgia Gould, our leader. So, it, it, it yeah. If if your leader, chief exec, aren't interested, it, it will be challenging. But I think pointing to other councils and the sort of things they're doing, I think, it is something that um, everyone can do. Absolutely. And there's a few exa uh, questions raised about the name social worker model. Uh, Sky was actually fortunate enough to support the pilot 
uh, of that model mm. across several local authorities. And on that, on our website, you'll find a whole host of information about the impact of, of that of that model, of, of that way of working, evidence of, of what kind of outcomes were, were were derived from from the named social worker model, and also some very easy to use pick up and use tools. So have a have a look at have a look at that. I think one of the biggest questions issues. Can yeah, I, could, there was a question there. Something it's gone, it's disappeared at the top, but it was something about caseloads for, for social workers with yeah, the named yeah. social worker model. I think this is part of letting go of the old world. Um, and if any of my the the, the CLDS social workers in Camden are listening, they they're going to sort of. Yeah, looking daggers at me or whatever, but the old world is about caseloads and reviews and assessments and actually if you've got 200 people in your caseload, um, it, that might sound totally, I'm sure it won't be that high, totally intimidating, but if it's about a relationship and you, you know them really well and you're not having to pick up a case file and read it when you've never met the person before or you're going out to do a review of someone you've never, never met before and will probably never meet again, Thinking about caseloads in the way that you traditionally would, I think, is we, we need to rethink it and reframe the, the discussion around caseloads. So I've got one big question that's come up from for Charlotte, and I think this is really important um, about the investment in, in the voluntary sector. So I don't think Sky doesn't think that you can do good strengths-based practice without investing in the voluntary sector and working with the voluntary sector. Just like your thoughts on, on that, Charlotte. Well, obviously. Um we're having such difficult conversations with system partners about this. It's like the NHS is finally discovering the VCS and is then confusing it with free resource. So I think we need to kind of, we need to message this really well because if we are coming across as petulant VCSE leaders who are stamping our little feet and saying, we're not playing until you pay us, um, not, none of this big push towards social prescribing and a better integration of the VCSE into of the, of the voluntary sector into primary care networks and all of that is going to work. But we need to also make it clear that we are very often very good value, but we are not free. And I think the confusion starts, you know, right at the top when, when Matt Hancock, our current Secretary of State, introduced um, social prescribing and, and the idea of the academy for social prescribing. He said, you know, rather than putting people on um, expensive antidepressants, we can put them on free activities like walking for health and um, power runs and you know whilst these things are cheap they are not free so I think um, you know this is such an ongoing issue we need to find a better way of landing that with our system partners and I think the um, the conversation we've just heard too about outcomes based conversation and looking at the money in the round if you do that properly then there should always be a slice uh, of money that can go to the third sector to support people in, in, and communities in this way because they can achieve these outcomes and you won't be able to achieve them on your own. Okay, just, just about to run out of time actually, but I should say that there's been a few questions raised about children's social care, uh, strengths-based approaches absolutely are thriving in many uh, children's social care environments. We have a paper on our website we produce with Leeds uh, Council on, on uh, strengths-based approaches and children's social care, so do have a look at that. So a, uh, we're absolutely aware of the many good things going on in children's uh, social care. I'm good, I've got time just for final reflections from my two colleagues before we have to say goodbye. Okay, so I just want to chip in very quick and totally emphasise the point about investing in the voluntary and community sector. So Camden does invest quite heavily. I think the an in, a model that I've heard about with the it might be worth checking out is Coventry and the way they're investing in their voluntary community sector, particularly around people's first contact. And then the other thing is we're calling it a named social worker approach here because you'd recognise it. Within Camden we're calling it much more of a named worker approach because it doesn't have to be a social worker. So where we've got care coordinators who are OTs or, or nurses or whatever, that's, the, the, the model is the same, is that continuity of care. We expect if you see a nurse that the next time you see a nurse it will be the same nurse. Thank you, Andrew. Finally, Charlotte. Um, it's maybe just a sort of personal reflection that I think I would really benefit from listening more to people who know a lot about social care and social work, and that there is a lot of differences, I think, but also some parallels to how health is structured and delivered. And sometimes I think because health is obviously based on medical knowledge, we kind of overcomplicate what happens in a, in a clinical conversation, and I think we could learn a lot from what I've heard, particularly from Andrew today, about 
uh, really getting value out of that engagement and really keeping the relationship personal, mm. um, which I'm, I, I really want to continue that conversation and take some of that thinking into how we influence health services more. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for taking part. Um, as I said, all the slides and the recording will be av available uh, to you short, uh, very soon. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and, and goodbye. Thanks, thank everyone. You.